yes, lifestyle medicine has to be the foundation, but it's not the whole house. And there's other places that can, can add extreme value in there. Functional medicine can add value. Conventional medicine can add value. Uh, but we need to rebuild with the right foundation. And rebuilding a house is no joke, right? You have to knock it down. <laughs> Welcome to Back to the Future podcast. My name is Victor Sadia, and I talk with brilliant minds and hearts of people who want to uproot and transform the current health and wellness paradigm. James Maskell has spent the last decade innovating at the cross-section of functional medicine and community. Originally trained in health economics, James is on a mission to flatten the curve of healthcare costs, building companies and creating content, community and integrated health systems and philosophies. He's the founder of the Functional Forum and Hill Community. James is a change maker. He knows that changes take time and that we usually cannot predict how our actions will impact the ecosystem further down the line. I am drawn to his passion for building community, knowledge, and hope within a failing medical system. I admire his methods of finding economically viable projects that bring together the best from lifestyle medicine, community medicine, functional medicine, alternative medicine, and all the other fields within the realm of health and wellness. He has been in this game for more than 10 years, and today's episode reflects on his journey and what we can expect in the next 10 to 20 years. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today we have Mr. James Maskell. James, thank you so much for being here. Great to be back on the podcast. Yeah, I recorded with you the first episode. That was four years ago. We are now approaching the 200th episode. And I must say, you um, you, you publish episodes at a faster pace than I do. Uh, and that's a huge job, my friend. I don't think I do. I thought you'd caught up with me. Um I'm like uh, maybe two, two or three a month. So I'm not, but uh, yeah, this has been uh, what, 10, 10 years. I think we started in almost 10 years. Uh, uh, September, 2014 was the first episode of the podcast. So yeah, it's been a, been a good run. Yeah. I love your, your style, which is very relaxed. And, you know, for me, the podcast has grown into a space of really deep conversations and I see it as a sacred space, almost as a therapy space too. Um, how has been for you? Because you have several kinds of episodes um, and you're also being invited to a lot of podcasts uh, all over the world. Um, how have you seen this, this media evolve over the past 10 years? Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, obviously um, there's a whole thing happening in the US now where there's a greater level of trust in individuals than there is in brands or organizations. And people have either built that trust or let that trust go. And it's interesting. I think 10 years ago, it was just sort of like maybe seen as a fad that would go away. But actually what you see now is that all the biggest brands in the world, you know, have a podcast because they're looking to build trust. They're looking to build intimacy. It's so easy to get the podcast and listen to the podcast. So I think that that is actually a fundamental change in society. And you see you know, Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, these names, you know, they have so many more people listening than these established brands. Um, even, you know, whatever the names are, they've built trust in their audience and that audience has grown and that audience is worldwide. The fact that all the technology is across all the different smartphones um, means that you can get your word out, you can get your brand out um, in your own authentic voice. And obviously, you know, that that's interesting. I mean, the number of people that you have trust with and the fact that even in, in social media world, like Victor sits next to, you know, some other person in some other world that has their own celebrity in some world. It's like it's uh, you have the same platform as a as a billion dollar enterprise. And it's just the degree to which you uh, build and curate that trust over time. What is the mindset that you go in into a podcast recording? You know, before you start recording, what's your mindset and what's your objective when you start a conversation that you're recording with someone? It's a good question. You know, so when I first started the Functional Forum, I had notes. 
And I would look at my notes and I would say, hey, make sure that I covered all the things in my notes. And got about six months into it. And this, by the way, is a, a different thing, which is a live studio audience show. Um, I just realized like I need to get rid of the notes and I need to just be present with the conversation and just take it where I needed to go. Um, I, you know, I, there are moments where I wish that I had gone into sort of long form conversation because I think ultimately having a half an hour podcast or otherwise is limiting in that you really only get to a surface level communication with whoever you're meeting with. But then at the same time, um, I just love the opportunity to meet people, to take out interesting parts of their story, to try and draw out the things that I think would be interesting to the audience that are listening to my podcast. And, you know, also just try and create a balance between the things that I'm passionate about, the things that are maybe interesting to the audience. And that's been a journey. I mean, when I started, there were so few choices and now there's a million choices. And so it's, it's a different world, but the people that I've met, the experiences that I've had through being on podcasts and also through, you know, doing my own has been amazing. Yeah. I, I, I have very present the podcast you recorded with Dr. Rang and Chatterjee. I think it was like last year. Uh, it was a very vulnerable, open conversation. And it's amazing how, you know, you, 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 you form, you form friendships, you know, through, through, through short or, or even long conversations, but there are a few conversations because all the people you are interviewing are very busy uh, and you've, and you've become friends of all of the leaders of, of, of our movement. Um, how has that been for you forming friendships with all these people? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. You know, I would say many of those friendships were actually formed, you know, years before. So, you know, if there's, there's, Dr. Chatterjee is a great example. You know, in, in 2014, um, I I missed the only flight that I've ever missed in my whole life. Like, I'm not a late person. I always, you know, on time. I never missed a flight. Apart from the one time I was in Colorado in 2014, we had just been in town to do the fifth ever functional forum. Dr. Chatterjee had watched the functional forum and had written to me on Facebook saying he thought it was cool. He loved the fact that we had Cypress Hill as the like music insane in the brain for the brain forum. So we had developed like that relationship and he said, Hey, I'm going to be at this conference. Like it'd be cool to meet. And I was like, I don't think we can meet um, because I'm flying out. So in the craziest of all stories, I missed the flight and um I've got a day. The next flight's not till the evening. So I've got a day and I hit him up and I say, Hey, I actually missed my flight. Why don't we meet up for lunch? So I end up having lunch that day with Dr. Chatterjee, who becomes like the biggest influencer in the whole of the UK and Europe. And his podcast is amazing. And he has all these TV shows where he shows chronic disease being reversed and it's amazing. And he's got like a heart and he's soulful and he's a musician and he's just like the best you know, the best embodiment of our medicine, I think, in the world, right? As far as like knowing it, but also being it. Also at that, who else is at that training is Dr. Robin Burzin, who ends up the next year starting Parsley Health and is the like juggernaut empire of the industry, right? Where she builds this incredible, you know, thing that saw 10,000 patients last year, which is more than, you know, anyone else. So So that was like those friendships were formed then and like at the conference the next year and we're all, you know, in Austin hanging out and whatever they're formed there. And then we're all going about in our lives and doing all these cool different things. And, you know, that, that podcast with Rongan that you mentioned is actually interesting because three years before I had my first idea that I was going to write a book about group visits. And I went to Rongan's house with my mom and we recorded the podcast. And back then he wasn't even doing video. He was just, you know, recording audio. And I was like, I have to do this now and whatever. And he told me afterwards, he was like, yeah, I just didn't really think it was very good and I'm not going to post it. And for a moment I was like, what? Like, you know, I was talking about my book that I was just about to write. And the thing that came back around was that between that moment and between the moment that I actually recorded with him, I had a deep personal journey with group right? Where I, where I was, you know, I was talking about the success of groups in a way before that, like I did my 
TED talk about it in 2015. And it was like, this is the way that we're going to solve healthcare. But it was very much like, oh, isn't it cool how all these groups are happening and look at the outcomes and look at the data. When we when I did this podcast with Rongan the sec the second time, his wife, who edits the podcast, you know, messaged me on on um WhatsApp. And it's just like, I just listened to your episode and I'm crying and it's amazing. And I'm so glad that, you know, that we did it. And it was because like in that time, in those three years, I had had some crazy things happen professionally, personally, you know, there was the pandemic, whatever, but I'd also joined this men's group and like found my own benefit from co-regulating with a group of emotionally mature men i had like emerged as a man in integrity in my you know my my relationship i had emerged as a better father i had emerged as you know i and i had actually witnessed extreme transformation in a free group amongst non-medical professionals and you know actually as time has gone on the group that I'm in has attracted, I would say even more, what I would say tough cases, like people with real mental health issues and and seeing that, per, seeing someone come into our group that we've contained, like our co-regulatory group and see people with actual like diagnosed mental health issues turn into extremely stable, extremely productive members of society makes me extremely happy and extremely proud to be part of. And, you know, ultimately that's a real human experience that I hadn't really felt apart from growing up in community and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but that's like kid stuff. This is like real adult stuff. Wow. So last night I launched my third book and I said that I began writing uh, my newsletter in Substack just to position myself as an influencer and someone who wants to talk about the future of health and as a consultant and to talk about coaching and groups. Uh, but still, it was this persona of someone who's who thinks he knows and he wants to share the information, which is very valuable. But as time evolved, even with this podcast, um, I got involved, personally involved with, with my own uh, development, uh, as you have just described. And it's amazing how what we're preaching in a systemic level has to be lived in our flesh at an individual and family level so that it really drives with a lot of energy. And, and, and we have we, you have had energy for, for 15 years on this. But, but I see these last three years that you described as, 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 as an even more openness to the vulnerable part of being a leader in a movement and also being a person who does not have all the answers at the same time, you know? And that that, that is not a contradiction. I think... It's rather uh, the, the power and the energy comes from that realization and to and to be surrounded by men and by people who 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 don't want to enshrine you as the expert. And I think this parallels perfectly with how we have been uh, portraying doctors uh, as the leaders of the health movement. And they themselves lack a lot of these experiences, don't you think? 100 percent. Yeah, I'm looking for. That, I mean, I there's another group that I know about men's work and all the people that were in the early days of it were all people that I really look up to as entrepreneurs, you know, people who had built companies. And as I sat in my group, I was like, you know, I in my group, there's like a farmer, there's an electrician, there's, a, you know, a realtor, there's a guy who runs a supermarket, like just normal people having normal lives, but obviously having you know, their own struggles and their own um, understanding of the world. And I, I really came to appreciate the fact that it wasn't like what some of the rest of my life was, which was like hobnobbing with, you know, whatever people, you know, for whatever reason that this was like salt of the earth people in real human experience that have been extremely valuable to me. And, and then, like you said, the parallel there is the doctor has only such a small window into your life. The person who has the biggest window into your life is you. You're having your lived experience. And so you have to be in the driving seat. And ultimately, you know, bringing back that locus of control to yourself is, is the first part of the journey. And I think that 
many of the practices that I admire focus on that at the beginning. And this is where I would say I've been, I've been talking about it on the podcast for the last little while, but I see a new standard of care emerging where I think there's a standard of care coming to the future of medicine that takes all the best bits from everything that we've learned and puts it into an economically viable model. And that is that the group, the community creates safety, facilitates the changes of behavior and creates the like personal transformation and the locus of control back to the person. And then the doctor is really there to tweak the individual nature of the protocol, whether that be drugs or supplements, that's their job. And that standard of care doesn't put the weight of the transformation onto the doctors and it puts the weight of the transformation onto the patient, but it distributes the weight into the community. And so what the doctor ends up being is sort of like a community builder plus specialist. And I think that actually that's, that's a good, a good use of resources for everyone. I love how you put this, um, uh, changing the locus of control into the patient, but also you say distributing this responsibility into the community. That's such a powerful thing. Um, um, I think that we talk a lot of, uh, about community and we know the benefits of community in all realms, you know, longevity, happiness, uh, nervous system, regulation, everything. Uh, and still, one thing is to talk about it and one thing is to experiment the feeling that my burden is distributed amongst my peers, my friends, my family. And that knowledge, that certainty that not all the weight of the world is put only onto my shoulders. You, you, you know what I mean? Um, what, are, what, what, what have been important experiences for you as an individual and as, um, and as a leader in the health arena, working with health professionals that give this feeling, not only the knowledge that the power of community is amazing, but the feeling and the certainty that it is like that? What experiences have drove your certainty into that way and others help professionals into that way? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, an interesting example is that, you know, when I started what I was doing, we were the only people doing anything like this. Like there were other people who had like a clinical training for doctors and there were big, you know, organizations that had training, but like, you know, even there are a dozen groups now doctors that have taken on they're going to mentor they're going to mentor the next generation of doctors to build health focused practices and so it's like oh you know 10 years ago it looked like are we literally going to have to like if we need a hundred thousand functional medicine practices are we going to have to like make it happen all ourselves that's like an unbelievably daunting task because it's like in my book the evolution of medicine the strategy was take the doc, you know, inspire the doctors to go out and build community focused health focused practices and give them the tools that they need to do that. Well, you know, there's a lot of other people that whether they got inspired it through my vision or whether they just had their own vision are now on that team and that thing is happening. And so it's like, there's a part of me that's just like, great, you know, great. I'm glad that like all these other people are inspired to play that role. I'm glad that there's people out there who can inspire and get to places that I can't get to. And, um, you know, there's a great, there's a great quote from Charles Eisenstein where he talks about the fact that like, you don't really know what, when you have something, when you have something that's so complex as society, you really have no idea what one action affects down the road, like the butterfly effect. Right. And, you know, ultimately part of how I sleep well at night is knowing that like, the vibe has gone out in many different ways over a decade. And there's many things happening that are sort of an, as a downstream result and I will never know what they are and it's fine. It just, but it's, but like chronic diseases were being reversed. Doctors are switching to practice in a new way. Um, so that's, you know, that's exciting on the other side of it. Like you could obviously say that like, our health is objectively worse in 10 years later as a society. So that like the battle is harder because there's more poison and whether that be social poison, you know, actual poison, 
um you know and and we have to work harder to combat combat those uh forces and, and how do you feel now like i i think we you I would love to hear how you feel now. And, and probably I'm, I'm I'm trespassing a bit here, but my my feeling when I hear you, when I read your your newsletter, um, when I talk to you, and also because I'm I've become more comfortable talking to you because at first I was very nervous approaching you uh, four or five years ago, um, but I feel, and this is my perspective, that you are a little a, a little bit less anxious a little bit less accelerated and uh, much more comfortable with what with with yourself with what you're doing with your big plans and also enjoying the process i don't know if that's if that was the case five years ago but i i do sense and i don't know you very well that this that there's been an evolution there is that accurate to say or that's not a, a good representation no it's totally accurate i mean if you ask my wife she would tell you that in 2012 so this is like two years before the functional forum even started I'm like in a panic because the mission that I'm here to do has not happened. And it's like, what's going on? Like, you know, I, I failed at the mission and I'm like 31, 32 years old. It's 2012. And I'm sort of like, it's failed. And now, you know, here I am, you know, there's been successes, there's been failures, there's been things that have been amazing and things that have been like sad. Um, But I actually had a very inspiring video that I saw recently by this guy called Mike Posner. And he's a musician and he's he's actually like a health, he's an interesting guy. He's got a sprouting company now uh, with a, a friend of mine. And he did this video where he was basically saying like, to all the people around that I see who are sad that like the thing didn't happen the way they wanted to happen or in the time and they think they missed the boat, or whatever. He was like, it's just the beginning. And if you take a step back and you realize like, it's not like the functional medicine revolution happened and I wasn't there for it. It's like, we're just so early, right? That ultimately this is, this is just the beginning. And now you see, like, if you take that attitude about it, it's like, Hey, I've got myself in a pretty good spot to have an impact, you know, to, to, uh, to change the world. Everything takes longer than you think, but there's like, there's an even bigger opportunity that there was 10 years ago because the level of chronic disease is more, you know, that all the things that are problematic are still problematic and worse. And also, you know, a lot of serious people are now aware of this issue and are doing their part and playing their role and singing their song, you know, alongside me and you and others And I feel like that that's inspiring. And yeah, look, I am a little less anxious because um, I have a more, more stable life. You know, if you look back, the, the perfect example of an unstable life is me on a bus in 2018 with my family, with no fixed abode, like literally living on a bus, launching one business while the other business is like not even really like stable. And, you know, looking back on that, that was insane. Like that was like, no wonder I sounded anxious because I was because like, what was I doing at that moment? But I was just so in it and I had so much momentum and I was just like, I thought I could do anything and I didn't need to be grounded because look at my track record. I wasn't grounded and look what I did. And I think part of that has been like, you know, coming back to a level of groundedness, a level of understanding of myself a relationship with my wife that's different, having a new child and wanting to be like really present for that child, not seeing going to conferences as a big win, but trying to be at home. And also like, I've got this whole other life. Like I, I've literally started and supported the growth of a school for the last three years. That's just down the road that both of my kids go to. And I had to do that because the state of California is insane. And like, I have very clear ideas about how I want my kids educated. And in order to do that, I literally had to be part of a team that built that thing because that thing was not available because of, you know, different, different areas. So that's like a thing that takes up time and is, a uh, you know, is like having another startup, except it's not, you know, it's not, it's just, it's just a thing. So it's like, those things need attention too. And my wife now is her own entrepreneur needs support and the kids need, need, need time and attention. And I, 
you know, my first daughter, Kaliana, was born six months before the Functional Forum started. And so, you know, those first three years when, you know, after what I said about 2012, when I was like, oh, shit, it's happening now. Like this, whatever's happening is new and exciting. And a thing that I made is popular and cool. And it's like doing the Lord's work in the way that I want to do it. Like, great. And I missed a lot of my first daughter's early few years, even though we were traveling together. And even though she came everywhere with me, I was not really present to that experience. And I'm much more present to it now. And I'm physically grounded in the countryside, you know, in a very different way than when I was living in LA and I was living in New York and everything was big and happening. And I'm just like one, um, you know, I'm, I'm one degree of separation away from that level of chaos. <laughs> Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. It's amazing how your life also uh, mirrors mine. Um, and and in, in a sense, it also mirrors, I think, if I can make this uh, a somewhat irresponsible um, re reflection, which is it also mirrors how civilization is moving. You know, uh, you, you, if you, we are very fast paced and moving and launching business here and there, and we're not really present with what's, what is happening. And really at, at the basis of our movement is, is just a slowing down, a, a coming back home, a, a, a sitting in your desk and, and communicating to the world through a grounded place and not through a nomadic uh, uh, way of being. And I, and I see a lot of health professionals um, also like, like needing these kinds of big uh, family decisions where they they exit this rat race that they've been uh, indoctrinated to 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 fulfill, and once they settle down into their computer and and and, and their desk and their home and their family, their community, their their children's school, whatever, um, all the things that were there uh, start channeling in the right directions. Uh, but no one has the courage to 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 jump first, you know. Like you had to experiment that in your own family and taking the risks of of making those decisions, um, and then seeing that it it is working. And 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 I'm talking also about myself here because I I also changed directions in many things that I did before, and and I see that's 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 one of the things that we need uh, more and more in this movement. Um, yeah, I saw a quote the other day. It said the happiest people that I know are slowing down, not speeding up. Yeah, yeah, and and it's funny because when once you slow down, you take better decisions that make make things, you know, go faster in a sense because they're more intelligent. You know, it's not just repeating the same, but they're being more more strategic or at least more in contact with the reasons on why you're doing what you're doing, uh, and they and they they. They tend to come less from a, a place of scarcity, but more from a place of I feel self-sufficient, I feel sufficient, and then I want I want to share, I want to build more. And I think that's that's also, you know, I think that's that's even a more sensible way of of doing businesses, as you said. The whole the whole movement is also predicated on the fact that we need to be building um, profitable businesses so that the, this spreads in a in a in a better way. Yeah, you have to find, you know, you have to find ways to get it to more people. And the, the one proven way that that's happened and the way that societal change has happened is through, you know, that sort of movement. I think there's going to be new iterations of that, that spread financial success amongst more people. It doesn't concentrate wealth. I think that's maybe the next the next thing i've actually never spoken about this really but i will say like i think that it's going to become obvious it, it is already becoming obvious in healthcare in america that those organizations that are delivering healthcare that are private equity funded or venture funded mm, don't have the heart unless it's software you know what i mean it's like software maybe but like the the private equity like if you if you go to a mental health institution that is owned by a private equity group, good luck. Like that's not going to be a lot of fun because, you know, the people with heart left 10 years ago. So I think there's a new model that will emerge. And I would love to be part of this in my lifetime is where um, communities are created, where the benefit of the success of the medicine 
benefits a much wider group of the population, including the patient, including the practitioner and including all the people who support. And I, I'm excited about that. Like, I think, I think that's the next phase because I feel like the systems that we've had, societal systems that we've had to support people are, are going to collapse. I mean, I think in America is definitely going to collapse. Maybe Mexico will be better run, but America is going to collapse. And so then it's like, okay, well, what support systems can be created? And hopefully it's not just going to have to be hyper local um, because I think that would be very scary and that would be like um, uh, a problem. But uh, yeah, I see that. Um, yeah, I see that. Like what, what will ever be Uber, right? The only thing that will let be Uber has really built something that is so easy, so much better than that old taxi system. It's so useful. It's so valuable. And yet, like, it doesn't really work for the taxi drivers and gets worse over time. And it doesn't really help the society that has Uber and it sort of degrades that over time. And so how long will we stand or how long will that be the system that works? Whereas if there was like a version of Uber that had the same, you know, functionality and ease, but, you know, created regenerative uh, systems for the empowerment of society and the people driving and the people going and the community at large, I would change the app that I used, right? And I think that's that's the future. Yeah, I would also love to see that in my lifetime. You know, we cannot talk about health without talking about capitalism. And 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 I do believe that we also as business entrepreneurs uh, on the health arena, we have to uh, find business models that begin to 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 embody this regenerative framework even at the expense of example. Can I give you an example yeah, of one? Please. Yeah. So I, I, on my podcast, I interviewed this guy, Michael Mabry. Um, he was the only functional medicine doctor in a group of 120 doctors in Johnson city, Tennessee. He put his hand up to say, Hey, I want to organize a community in Johnson city. He had his first event there. 90 practitioners and doctors came from, you know, a, a city of 70,000 people, you know, in, not a very like affluent part in Appalachia, rural Appalachia in, you know, in Tennessee. That organization, I interviewed the CEO of that organization and, you know, they'd been asked to be in like a roll up of primary care clinics and blah, 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 join the local hospital. They'd maintained their independence. They see 150,000 patients right across all of those doctors and what they did. And they decided they were going to go in the other direction. And so they have like an ESOP, which is an employee stock option plan. And that ESOP is not just there for the doctors, but is there for the nurses and it's people that from the front desk or whatever. And so here you have, you know, a whole primary care system that is incentivized by value. So they're not incentivized by billing more people. They're incentivized to keep people healthy. And now they are sharing ownership amongst all the people that actually participate in that area. And so I would say if you look 10 years down the line, the chance of Johnson City, Tennessee getting healthier just by the economic incentives that have been created is much higher than the town across the way where the hospital was again acquired by another private equity group. And then they cut costs and they, you know, all that, like the whole rest of medicine. I think that's interesting. I guess you you just landed on the idea for your next book documenting all these all these things that are happening all around and that they are they are changing the system quietly but in the long term that's that those are the only companies that will prevail uh, i hope so uh and we need more of that knowledge and awareness that this is already happening so that other people get good ideas and also good empowerment to say yes i can do that too and i can risk my own logic by by going not not all the, not 180 degrees but slightly to the left. And the important here is the direction because these, these principles just accrue more ideas, more community and, and more momentum and they grow very organically, but we need to take those steps. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that book, my friend. Well, yeah, you never know. I mean, I am coming into a cat into across various different ways to do that. I think there's a very interesting future for uh, fractional ownership and tokenization structures um, where you can 
a community can benefit from their success. And, um, you know, I've had various, I actually, right when the pandemic hit, the week that the pandemic hit, I was in India and I heard an incredible presentation by a guy by the name of Andrew Hewitt. And he's been an extreme uh, inspiration to me for the last four years. We've spoken pretty regularly. And this is his dream, actually. This might be his book. Uh, but I think there's real potential in it, in healthcare and his his concepts. And it's really about how do you how do you interlock um, groups of people in such a way that they have like the most incentive to add value. And there are actually examples of this. So he studied, um, I think it's the Mondragon group society in um, Basque's region of Spain. And in the 80s, when Spain um, basically like gave up all of their means of production to go only into tourism, the Basque people didn't. And they made cool furniture and they made all this other stuff that they've been making for generations. And that furniture became more valuable because everything else that was made in Taiwan was fell apart or Ikea, right? People were still looking. There was still a value. There were still people looking for well-made, historically made high quality furniture and they were still making it. And, you know, when COVID happened and the economy tanked because there was no tourism in Spain, they didn't feel it, didn't feel a thing. And a percentage of all of the people's effort, you know, went into a communal pool that supported the community. And I think that's that's very interesting. Do you see these kinds of uh, uh, ideas, success stories, topics being discussed enough in health professional congresses or not, not, not so much, right? I think we're starting the conversation right here. You know, yeah. let's look back in five years and do it. I literally just got off a call yesterday um, with a guy who I've known for years. I don't really want to tell his story because I think it's his story to tell. And he, you know, he basically has lived in the most conservative city in America and created a physical location to house things that are not acceptable in the most conservative city, including green juice and Reiki, you know, and whatever else that we would think is kind of normal in California and did it and has a vision for, um, what would you say? Like the fractional ownership of commercial real estate, should we say, as a way of bringing people out of poverty. I think that's very interesting. And I think that there could be, you know, and I, I guess I'll share the vision that I had as a result of the vision on the phone call with him is there's a lot of malls, very close to me here that are dying, mm -hmm. right? Because the mall is is a dying model where everything can be bought online. But I think some of those buildings could be rebuilt as, you know, centers for community, centers for healing. Listen to Robert Kennedy's, you know, latest um, documentary that he put out about, about healing and healing in community. It's like the video version of my book, The Community Cure. I could see malls across America that are wiped out by, Amazon and Walmart and whatever, you know, being brought back to life as modern healing centers where, you know, you could fractionally own micro parts of all of the, you know, different old shops. And the thing about health, there's, there's like people who can help you with your finances because financial stress can give you chronic illness. You can have all the food stuff. You can have all the community stuff. You can have the hairdressers and the nails and whatever you can have all of the things. Cause it all affects the health. Uh, I just, I, that was just yesterday. So I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the milieu of understanding those things. And I know that there's a coming reckoning for private equity based healthcare that has no heart and has probably terrible outcomes. And um, I think that there's a renaissance that will come as a result of it that is wider ownership and a social safety net that is not coming from the government, but is coming by groups of people working together voluntarily. Wow. My, my nervous system just relaxed <laughs> by hearing you. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, sharing those sharing the story is probably the best the best way of just everyone has a gift to give, you know? And sharing these stories just reminds people that yeah, I'm I'm a doctor, I'm a coach, I'm an uh, I'm a farmer, whatever. And just with this mentality, I know I can add a lot of value to 
Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say a new conception of how to organize uh, socioeconomic life, but definitely uh, it's a choice that I can start making, uh, and that in the past I never thought I could make because I had to follow the American dream or the American way of life. Um, and I think that 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 question is 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 so generative. And, you know, people like us would, would love to have this in a manual and would have to train in communities all over the country uh, to do these things. But probably it's not only it's not about the training. It's more about the putting them together in the same room and just throw a few values that are of interest and allow the community to to bear their gifts to the others and to co-create uh, without a top down approach. Yeah. Absolutely. And look, there's ideas like, you know, ideas that maybe didn't work the first time around, like holacracy, um, which is essentially like a more holistic way of, of generating success together where there's not a, a top down approach. I wonder, I don't think those systems work very well when you're doing things like coding and technology, but I think they do work very well when you're, you know, building community and, and, and creating health. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of pieces that could could come together and you know i think that's that's definitely a pathway that i'm interested in you know new health with the alternative to health insurance that i created definitely had that energy at the center of it which is like people taking care of people in a new way and it sounds a bit like insurance but it's actually nothing like insurance even though the same thing is happening because the energy is different mm -hmm. right the energy is different when it's like hey i'm here to support my brothers rather than that like there's this you know, multinational, massive corporation that is, you know, that is distributing care. Like there's a heart part of it. And I think there's a, there's a big part of it there. So I'm excited to, yeah, I'm excited to tread that path. And I think maybe you're right that that is the next book. Mm. Yeah. I love, I love that you say it's, it's the energy is different and, 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 and we all know what that means, you know? Um, tell me something The the lifestyle medicine community uh, they say that lifestyle medicine is, the, is is not a new house in the block of health and medicine, uh, but it's a foundation for every house in the block of uh, houses of life of of medicine and health. Uh, do you agree that lifestyle medicine is is at the foundation of all the other branches of health and medicine? And and also, how do you envision the lifestyle medicine movement? Because I think we shouldn't constrain it to movements. And we have had this discussion before the functional medicine, the integrative medicine, the lifestyle medicine movements. And, and, and it seems that they're very different just because they have different names. And, and that preoccupies me in the long term because we, we we're sometimes just trying to pick the color of our Jersey instead of just knowing that we're on the same path and in, in building the same energy. Yeah. I agree with the quote. You know, I think that like the only reason why like, just think how disconnected we have to be from ourselves and the truth in order for lifestyle medicine not to be the solution or not to be the foundation of the fucking cities that we built. You know what I mean? We built these cities of medicine with no understanding of it. That screams disconnection or it screams like extremely well thought out business principles that are counter to human health. It, it's those two things together. Um, because we really have a perfect system for the creation of profit, you know, in medicine. Um, and if that was the plan, it's been a great plan and they've had a good ride, but it can't, we, you know, it, it's not, it's not tolerable in the medium term, it's not sustainable. So I, I agree with that. And I think that, look, lifestyle medicine is having a moment. I'm really proud to see the lifestyle medicine movement make its way into the places that it's making. And um, I, yeah, I agree with that statement entirely. And I think that, um, I think that people are realizing it. You know, I think it's, it's coming around and I think that there will be a progression. Um, take an example, right? So Dean Ornish just announced his thing with lifestyle medicine and Alzheimer's. And yeah, it's not, it's actually not a surprise that you can prevent and reverse Alzheimer's with lifestyle medicine because the finger study came out in 2013 and was the same thing. 45% of people get better. However, you know, if you build the foundation of the house with lifestyle medicine, but then you also have specialists that can uncover the causes of the Alzheimer's, remove those causes, you can go from 45% to 75% because 30% of people, it the lifestyle was necessary, but not sufficient to solve the issue. 
And I'm literally like a walking personal example of that where my father, you know, was in a moldy house and had like a dramatic close near death experience with, you know, very rapid cognitive decline. And you always say like, you know, if someone has a good model, they can predict the future. Well, my doctor, Christine Burke, I told her what's going on. Very rapid decrease in cognitive function from my dad. She knows she's one of the six doctors that's doing the dementia reversal trial. She's like, if that happens, if it's that rapid, it's always an infection. Look for mold, look for an infection. I fly to South Africa. I walk into his apartment that he's no longer in because he's collapsed in someone else's house and he's staying with a friend. And I'm like, here it is. I can smell it. I can see it. And so it's like, there's a, you know, yes, lifestyle medicine has to be the foundation, but it's not the whole house. And there's other places that can, can add extreme value in there. Functional medicine can add value. Conventional medicine can add value. Uh, but we need to rebuild with the right foundation. And rebuilding a house is no joke, right? You have to knock it down. <laughs> yeah, the knocking down is 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 what we're doing and we're doing it through love through community through through sustainable businesses through through vulnerable um uh sharing of experiences uh and then there we have to we have to grieve we have to apologize we have to uh, uh you know all these those emotions that at the base are always holding us back as individuals and as community um so i so yes i i do believe that that knocking the house down can be also a beautiful process if we choose to, instead of just waiting for it to come crashing down because it is crashing down. Yeah. All right, I'll my friend. You, I'll leave you with one quote. So it's it's uh, it's April 2013, and I've you know I've just come off the back of like, be you know asking my wife like a 2012's happened and my vision has not come into fruition. And it's 2013 and I've got my first big speaking gig and I'm in New York and I'm speaking and Deepak Chopra speaking and I'm in the green room with Deepak Chopra and my wife is like nine months pregnant, nine and a bit months pregnant. And I said to my, I said to Deepak, I said, Deepak, you know, I'm thinking of calling my daughter Kaliana, you know, after the goddess Kali. Uh, but my dad says that Kali is the goddess of destruction. What do you think? And Deepak looks at me and my wife are the only three people there. And he says, the only thing that Cali destroys is ego and ignorance. And that was it. And I was just like, okay, well, Kaliana Grace, my daughter. And from that moment, I was like, there's a creative destruction. There's a book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. I don't agree with all of it, but it is a creative destruction that's happening right now. And the foundation is being built for the future of medicine. And I'm excited to be part of it. And I'm excited to be part of it with you, my brother. I'm excited too, my friend. I thank you for welcoming me into your world, for 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 co-creating this friendship and for co-creating a lot of ideas that are uh, slowly um, rebuilding a house, a beautiful house. Thank you so, so much, my friend. 